Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. This is part two of the solar energy segment. In this part we will discuss advanced solar cell concepts and solar thermal power plants. We saw earlier that the efficiency of single junction solar cells cannot exceed a theoretical efficiency of 31%. In part one, we discussed this slide. Just to remind you, all the light that is above the band gap of the absorbing semiconductor material, the difference between the photon energy and the band gap energy is dissipated as heat within the absorbing material. These losses can be reduced with multi-junction solar cells. In multi-junction solar cells, a number of semiconductors with decreasing band gap are stacked on top of each other and so when the light hits the surface it encounters first the solar cell with the largest band gap. So only the highest energetic photons are being absorbed in this layer. The remainder of the light is being passed to the second solar cell which has a slightly lower band gap. That again takes the top part of the remaining photon energies out of the spectrum and converts it to electricity. The remaining light goes into the third cell, which yet has a smaller band gap, and so forth until we end up at the solar cell with the lowest band gap at the bottom of the stack. This is shown here again in the solar spectrum, and please note that the spectrum is reversed on the energy axis, so we have the highest energy photons on this side, and the lowest energy photons, the infrared photons, on this end of the spectrum. In this stack of solar cells, the top layer, so this corresponds to the band gap of 2.4 electron volts, that only absorbs this range of photons. In this top layer, these here are converted to electricity. All the other ones are being passed to the next layer, to the blue one and the blue one has a smaller band gap. It again takes the, the most energetic photons out of the remaining light and converts it to electricity. The remainder again goes into the next solar cell which has a yet smaller band gap, here in this example 1.43. And so here the same happens. Again the highest energetic photons are being converted to electricity and the remainder is being passed into the next layers. And so we go through all the layers until we hit the final one, which takes the lowest energy photons. The great advantage of this concept is obvious. The absorbed photons in each of these layers, they are pretty close in energy to the band gap of that layer, and that reduces the absorption losses. A drawback of this design is that it is much more complex to manufacture, in comparison to single junction cells and therefore this type of cell is much more expensive. This limits use of these systems in concentrating photovoltaic systems where the sunlight over a larger area is focused with some type of optics onto a small sliver of solar cell which can then be expensive but in return has a high efficiency uh, in converting the sunlight to electricity. It is clear that a larger number of junctions should result in a better efficiency. In theory, an infinite number of junctions should match the photon energies most perfectly and therefore the efficiency should be best. In practical terms, we see here from this curve of theoretical efficiencies, depending on the number of junctions, the largest gains are within the first few junctions that are being added to the design. So with three or four junctions, one can reach values in the high 50% range. Additional gains are through concentrating the sunlight. If we go from unconcentrated light to 50 times concentrated light, we can gain another 10% or so in efficiency. The reason for this comes from the fact that if there is a higher photon density and more electron hole pairs, the recombination rate in proportion to the number of photons is being reduced. There are two basic strategies to make multi-junction solar cells. The most popular is to stack them in series, like we just saw it uh, schematically on the previous slide. A 
competing method is to laterally distribute the junctions over the surface of a photoabsorber, but this requires that optics are being used that disperse light of different wavelengths into different regions on the surface, similar to what you would experience with a prism. These figures were taken from the data sheet of a commercially available multi-junction cell. It's made by Spectrolab, owned by Boeing. Uh, this cell has 40% efficiency at 50 watts per square centimeter insulation. If you do the math, this corresponds to 500 kilowatts per square meter. There are 10,000 square centimeters in a square meter. That is in turn corresponding to a concentration of 500x relative to natural sunlight, which is coming in at 1 kilowatt per square meter. If you look at the maximum power voltage of 2.76 volts, that's pretty high, and that is of course a result of having three solar cells in series, so the voltages across each of them add up. And you see here the maximum power rectangle. The absorption spectra of each of the three solar cells are shown in this graph, superimposed to the solar radiation spectrum. Again, note that we have the short wavelengths, the high energies, the UV light on this end and the infrared light on this end of the spectrum. And these three absorption spectra now show which of the wavelengths of the solar spectrum are absorbed in each of the three cells. So the, the red spectrum corresponds to the smallest band gap, that's the germanium film at uh, 0.66 electron volts. The photons of the mid-range, they are being absorbed in the gallium indium arsenide layer with 1.33 electron volts band gap and the, the highest uh, energy photons are being absorbed in the gallium indium phosphide thin film at 1.82 electron volts band gap. The principal alternative to stacked multi-junction solar cells is the lateral design. In the lateral design, the light that goes through the concentrator is chromatically dispersed across the surface and that has one great advantage. We can put solar cells that specialize in a certain wavelength in different locations on the surface of the device. So red could be absorbed here, mid-range wavelengths here and high energy wavelengths over here. That means that each of these cells could be run independently in terms of current and voltage and electronics could be used to mix and match the outputs of these solar cells. That allows a much wider range of material combinations and device designs. The major drawback of this design is that optics that are chromatically dispersed typically are not good at concentrating. And so usually such uh, devices have a much weaker concentration than the stacked designs. Multi-junction solar cells are most useful for concentrating photovoltaic technology, in short CPV. In this technology, a large area concentrator is used that focuses the light on a small solar cell that has a high efficiency, such as the multi-junction cells. There are various uh, ways to concentrate light. Outside standard lenses, uh, one can use Fresnel lenses, uh, parabolic mirrors, uh, so-called cast grain optics, and uh, light guide based uh, solar optics. When you look at these diagrams, it is clear that all these concentrating concepts only work if the light comes from a well-defined direction. For this reason, concentrating photovoltaic cells do not work under cloud cover. The sun must be fully visible to the solar cell that the light can be properly focused. That essentially limits these designs to desert areas and regions on our planet that have very little cloud cover. Another requirement for such cells is that they actually track the motion of the sun across the sky so that the, the sun is always perpendicular to the cell. Otherwise, if the sun would move here and the direction of the impinging light would change, the focal point of the concentrator would wander 
and of course that would have the consequence that it would not hit the solar cell anymore that is installed in the focal point for normal incidents. This requires that these cells are being placed on tracking mechanisms that are properly programmed to follow the sun. This further increases the price of such solar cell systems. This map shows the average solar energy per year and square meter across the globe. So on the scale, uh, blue is less than a thousand kilowatt hours per square meter and the uh, yellow end of the scale is 2500 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So we see that the US has a large area that has abundant sun which is uh, suitable for concentrator systems. Another interesting feature of concentrating photovoltaic systems is their much more constant power output in comparison with fixed solar systems. We see this here. The blue curve is the power output of the concentrating photovoltaic system while the yellow curve is the output of a fixed system. We see as soon as the sun rises the output of the concentrating system goes up much more rapidly and then it remains in a plateau for a few hours until the late afternoon hours and then it drops quickly again as the sun sets. The fixed system in comparison has a much more gradual increase. It essentially simply tracks the path of the, of the sun with its power output because the number of photons continuously varies depending on the angle of the sun relative to the uh, solar panel. This gives us a very short peak period the concentrating system is much better matched to the demand curve, which in hot regions is peaking out in the late afternoon as air conditioning demands are maximum. It's interesting to look at the start and the end of the fixed system curve where we get some time where the fixed system still produces a little bit of power while the concentrator system is already fully shut down. This has to do with the fact that fixed systems can use diffuse light such as is present during dusk and during dawn where the sun is not visible yet however the sky is already reflecting some of the uh, sunlight uh, before the sun is actually rising above the horizon. Now I want to discuss a couple commercially available concentrating photovoltaic systems. The first one is a Fresnel lens based design made by Soitec Concentrix Solar. Here you see a schematic of Fresnel lenses. A Fresnel lens provides the same lens curvature which essentially defines the focal point of the lens but it is much thinner than a conventional lens. This has impacts of course of the optical quality of such a lens. This is why they are not popular for photography because of these uh, breaks in the uh, curvature. However, to concentrate solar light on a solar cell, this is perfectly all right. The great advantage of Fresnel lenses is that they are much lighter than regular lenses because there is much less material involved. So once you have that Fresnel lens, you have a basic solar panel design like this. Each of the Fresnel lenses has a small solar cell beneath in the focal point and this solar cell is mounted on a heatsink because of the high level of light concentration which causes high heat dissipation in the solar cell. The great advantage of these Fresnel lens based systems is their low weight which reduces the cost of the uh, tracking and mounting system. Here you see an assembled Concentrix solar module. Each of these squares is one of the Fresnel lenses and each of these lenses has a small solar cell underneath. These solar cells are triple junction cells made from 3.5 semiconductors. They probably have an efficiency of about 40%. The peak power of the module is 75 watts. The area of the module is about a third of a square meter and that takes it to 217 watts per square meter. So we can say that this panel is about 21 or 22 percent efficient per area. Here you see a picture of a complete tracking unit made with Concentrix solar panels. 
each of those rectangles is one of those panels that we just saw on the previous slide. The unit consists of 216 of such modules, which gives it a 77 square meter module area, assuming a 850 watts per square meter insulation it can produce a power of 14 kilowatts. It would need about 71 or 72,000 of these units to replace one coal-fired power plant with one gigawatt output. The second commercial concentrating photovoltaic system I want to discuss is made by Morgan Solar. They use the total internal reflection principle. The great advantage of this type of concentrator is that the solar cell is built right into it at the center. So all we have is a flat disk that concentrates all the impinging solar light to its center and in the center we can put the solar cell. That makes for a very flat panel that in turn has an even lower weight than what can be achieved with the Fresnel lenses. Consequently, Morgan Solar has developed a very lightweight and tr almost transportable tracker system onto which these uh, solar panels are being mounted. Another advantage of this Sun Simba system is that it doesn't need any major building activities for foundations and so forth. The support structure is built on freestanding frames. This makes the system self-supporting. The last advanced solar cell concept I want to discuss are organic solar cells. Organic solar cells try to lower the cost of photovoltaics by being ultra cheap per area. This is possible with organic materials because they can be processed from solution. This enables methods like spin coating or printing or even roll-to-roll -roll printing to manufacture solar cells. Here you see a schematic of spin coating. One applies the solution that contains the organic material on a spinning substrate and because of the centrifugal forces the film spreads out across the surface and a very uniform and good quality film is established. Printing can be done with screen printing or even inkjet techniques. The idea is to cover large areas at a low price and this makes these cells cheap. Other advantages are that the absorber layer can be very thin because of the very high absorption coefficients of organic absorbing materials. This enables flexible substrates and also of course reduces the weight dramatically of such solar cells. Challenges of organic solar cells have their root in the materials properties of organic absorbing materials. There is significant photo degradation. Think of your plastic dashboard or synthetic curtains in your living room that degrade in the sun. Similar effects happen to organic solar cells. Here is a figure from a study where they measured the short circuit current over time in a organic solar cell made from these materials MDMO, PPV and PCBM, complicated chemical materials names. So they expose them to one-third sun, that means uh, one-third of the thousand watts per square meter at 40 centigrades environment temperature. And so you can see that over only 50 hours the short circuit current already declined by 5%. So there are definitely issues with regard to stability with organic solar cells. That's the reason that they need to be encapsulated to prevent oxygen and water to enter the uh, cell. In general, they have still fairly low efficiencies, even though there are some cells that were reported at 14%, but these are strictly laboratory cells. Uh, large area cells have rather efficiencies in the range of 5 or 6%. But this can be compensated by the very cheap manufacturing costs that can be achieved with these materials. Another issue is that most of the promising organic materials right now absorb in the green and blue region. And so there is still some research to be done to find absorbers then that can cover red and lower energy photons. These are some schematic representations of some of the interesting materials for organic photovoltaics. Essentially you see these carbon rings that have delocalized molecular orbitals, conjugated electronic systems. 
That means that electrons and holes can move in these materials similar to what happens in semiconductors. As you can tell, the number of atoms is more limited than in a macroscopic silicon wafer. We don't have a quasi-infinite number of states in the anti-bonding and bonding orbitals of these molecules. We don't really have bands yet, like in a semiconductor. We have rather a densely spaced set of individual anti-bonding and bonding states. But in essence, the functionality of these molecules is similar to semiconductors, and that's what makes it possible to build solar cells with this type of material. As an example for an organic solar cell device, here is the device structure of a polymer fullerene cell. In this cell we have an active layer that absorbs the light that is composed of two materials, PCBM and MDMO-PPV. You saw these molecules on the previous slide. The PCBM is an electron transporter and the MDMO-PPV is a hole transporter material. So we have sort of a heterogeneous PN junction. Many organic solar cells are made with this principle because the mobilities of the electrons and the holes are very low on these molecules compared to inorganic semiconductor materials. So it is good to mix the N and P type materials together that the electrons and holes don't have to travel so far until they encounter the interface phase that separates them. Outside the active layer we have the, the contact layers. On the back of the cell we have a metal film which is interfaced to the active layer through an interface layer made from lithium fluoride that helps the charge transfer between the active layer and the metal. On the other side we need something transparent because that's where the light is coming from and so we have a transparent conductive polymer and then a transparent conductive oxide. This polymer again helps to make a good contact between the inorganic oxide and the organic active layer. Of course, the scope of this course is not to discuss all the solar cell technologies that are being pursued in research and development. Uh, here is an interesting graph that summarizes the progress of the most significant technologies that are being investigated. It shows the efficiency as it increases over time. And so you see that in general the efficiencies are going up, but we also see that several of the technologies like silicon, for example, seems to uh, be plateauing. Where there is still strong increase uh, seems to be in the multi-junction cells and of course here in the more recently developed emerging photovoltaic cells such as the organic cells that we just encountered there is still a lot of uh, gain because the research on these materials started much later than on some of the established inorganic materials. I invite you to go to Wikipedia and download the latest version of this graph. What's shown here is the 2014 version. It is updated every year by the National Renewable Energy Lab. This concludes the photovoltaics uh, chapter of this segment. The next chapter is about solar thermal power. Uh, or concentrating solar power as it is also known, CSP. In this technology one uses concentrators, such as are shown here, mirrors, that focus the sunlight onto a receiver. And in this receiver there is a fluid that is being heated up and the heat in this fluid is then used to drive a heat engine similar to a conventional power plant, except that the heat is here generated with solar energy. Of course, we have the same thermodynamic loss principles like in conventional power plants, but because of the currently still low conversion efficiency of photovoltaic cells, this technology is very similar in cost and efficiency like uh, photovoltaics. An interesting aspect of CSP is that one can directly store the heat in a reservoir and that offers interesting possibilities with regard to extending this technology into times where the sun is not shining, such as the night. There are four principal ways to build a concentrating solar power CSP plant. 
Here we see the parabolic trough collector system that is possibly the most favored design right now. The liquid that is to be heated is fed through a tube that is in the focal point of this parabolic reflector. A variant of this technology is the linear Fresnel collector. We also have again a tube that is in the focal point of these reflector strips. Then there is the central receiver system with dish collector. So here we have a parabolic mirror and the absorber is in the focal point. And then finally we have the central receiver system with distributed reflectors. This is what we saw on the previous slide on the photo. There the absorber is typically on a tower to have an unobstructed line of view to the multitude of mirrors that are in front of it. And these mirrors, they are on tracking systems and these tracking systems keep focusing the sunlight on this absorber during the day. In fact, it should be pointed out that like for all concentrating solar power schemes, all of these reflectors need to be tracked to keep the absorber in the uh, focal point. The possibly greatest advantage of concentrating solar power plants is that they can be combined with heat storage systems and also with backup burners. This enables a so-called firm capacity similar to conventional power plants. That is different from photovoltaic plants where storage is really one of the big issues currently because the storage of electricity is still difficult. This schematic shows how this would work. The solar power plant starts outputting at sunrise during the day. As the sun is shining, part of the solar energy is being diverted to a storage facility. That means that the uh, power plant runs at a level that is lower than what would be possible by using all the heat from the sun. And this stored heat is then used after sunset to extend the operating hours of the uh, solar power plant. Once the storage runs out, a backup burner can take over and continue providing the output power of this power plant. This enables a seamless combination of solar with conventional power. This schematic shows the principal layout of a concentrating solar power plant with storage. Here we have the parabolic trough mirrors and the fluid that is circulated through them. And then we have here a valve through which we can choose whether we will directly heat the working fluid for the turbine that generates the electricity or if we divert the hot liquid to this heat exchanger that allows to heat up the liquid in the hot tank. The stored hot fluid can be pumped over to a cold tank and this heat exchanger can run in the opposite direction. So one can pump cold fluid in here and heat it up and then feed it into the turbine when needed. Such a system can reach up to 15% average efficiency per collector area. There are several parabolic trough plants in operation in the US. This one here is called Solar One. It is in Nevada. That makes sense because Nevada is a desert state and so we have a mostly blue sky that gives us that direct insulation that concentrating solar power needs. This uh, plant has a peak output of 64 megawatts and an area of about 1.4 million square meters. I determined that by evaluating a Google satellite image. If you remember the cadmium telluride first solar plant in Wald Polens in Germany that had about 1 million square meters and its output was 40 megawatts. So you see that this here is a little bit less than half bigger and we have about half more output. So they are fairly similar, but this here is a little bit better. And we can calculate the efficiency relative to this area. We have 64,000 kilowatts divided by the area that gives us 0.046. And so we have an efficiency of 4.6% of the entire plant relative to the area that it covers. So it's a little bit better, we get about 1% more, but it is pretty similar to photovoltaics. Here's a list of the current lineup of parabolic trough power plants in the US. If you add up the net output numbers, 
This is about 400 megawatts, so it's almost half of a major conventional power plant in total. I calculated the efficiencies relative to the solar field area, so that's just the area of the parabolic troughs, and one gets numbers here. The older plants seem to have around 16%, and this latest, the Solar One plant, has 18% efficiency. This is probably the reason why the plant efficiency is a little bit better better than for the solar power plant in Val Poland because those cadmium telluride solar cells had maybe 12% efficiency. A competing concept for concentrating solar power plants are so-called tower power plants. These are based on the distributed reflector style. The hallmark of these power plants is that they can reach a much higher temperature in the receiver. The reason for that is that the receiver is on a tower and therefore it can have line of sight to many mirrors that are all focused on this one receiver. So we can put much more sunlight into a much smaller area, therefore the temperature can be higher than in a parabolic mirror system. Because of the high temperature, the transfer medium is usually molten salt, and the temperatures are in excess of a thousand centigrades. Because of this higher temperature, if you remember the energy basics chapter where I discussed thermodynamics a little bit, if the high temperature reservoir is at a high temperature, we can get a higher efficiency out of the heat engine, which is this turbine here. And therefore, it can be expected that tower power plants have a higher efficiency than the lower temperature parabolic mirror plants. So it's estimated that these plants can have about 20%. There is a prototype of such a tower power plant in uh, Seville in Spain. It is built with uh, 624 mirrors, they call them heliostats. Each has 120 square meters area, that uh, puts the total mirror area at uh, almost 75,000 square meters. This uh, tower is 115 meter high and the heat exchange area up here is 200 square meters. The output of this plant is 11 megawatts peak. That translates into about 0.15 kilowatts per square meter of mirror area. And so we can say we have a 15% efficiency based on the area that's covered with mirrors. Let's have a look at the satellite image to determine the efficiency relative to the area that this plant occupies. There are two plants of this type, PS10 and PS20. What I was discussing on the previous slide is PS10. And so PS10 is pretty much a circular area which is 800 meters in diameter. So we can use the area formula and calculate that we have about 500,000 square meters and at 11 megawatts output this would correspond to an extracted power of about 2%. This is considerably worse than the parabolic trough number which was 4.6 the reason for this difference is most likely that these mirrors need to be spaced further apart because of their size that they do not shade each other. Another concept for concentrating solar power are dish sterling power plants. They are based on the parabolic mirror concentrator type. Here the sunlight is focused into the focal point where the Stirling engine is located. The sunlight directly heats the hot end of a Stirling engine, which then drives a generator. This technique can also be combined with a combustible fuel burner to bridge low sun or no sun periods. However, as a drawback, one should note that uh, no heat storage is possible with this type of concentrating solar power plant. There were at least two commercial attempts to produce these types of power plants, but they both ended in failure and bankruptcy. It appears that this technology is not cost competitive with the parabolic trough concentrating solar power plants. It's interesting to check out how a Stirling engine works. A Stirling engine is often called an external combustion engine. And the reason for that is that the heat is introduced to the Stirling engine from the outside of the cylinder. So inside the cylinder we have a working fluid 
and the cylinder is enclosed basically it's airtight so the working fluid just stays in there and is repeatedly used for each cycle it's often helium or hydrogen inside this cylinder we have two pistons one is the power piston that is the piston that performs the work and this piston is moved forward and backward here in this narrow part of the cylinder by expansion and contraction of the working fluids, the gas that is inside this cylinder. Like in any heat engine, this working fluid needs to be heated and then cooled so that the cycle can repeat. And in this case, the heating and cooling is achieved by this displacement piston. So this end of the Stirling engine is hot and this end is cold. And so what the displacement piston does in the right phase with the power piston, it moves the working fluid from the hot end to the cold end by displacing it. So you can imagine if this displacement piston goes over to the left here, the working fluid will pass by the uh, cylinder. This is a fairly loose fit and go over into the cold part and that will lead to its contraction and therefore the piston would be sucked back. If it's in the hot end like here then um, the piston will be pushed out because the fluid expands. So we always go between these two states and these are the uh, two cycles of a Stirling engine. There is an animation that comes with these pictures so let's go to the website. Another interesting concept of solar thermal power plants are chimneys. Chimneys use thermal convection to extract work from the kinetic energy of air molecules. In essence, one builds a collector from glass or plastic foil and under this collector, as the sun impinges, the air heats up and because of the lower density of this heated air, an updraft is created into the cold air that is at the end of the chimney. So all we have to do is put a turbine in the path of the air and we have a solar power plant. Here's the formula for the power output of solar chimneys. The essential variables in there are the height of the chimney, the temperature at the exit of the chimney and the collector size. The higher and the larger, the more power and the lower the temperature, the more power we get. This graph plots this relationship. On the x-axis we have the chimney height, goes from 100 to 500 meters, and on the y-axis we have the collector diameter, 200 to 1000 meters. The lines inside the graph, they show chimney height and collector diameter combinations that have the same output power. So we can compensate a small collector with a high chimney and vice versa. The numbers on the lines, they need to be multiplied with 100 kilowatts, so this here would be 142 kilowatts and up here we would have 2100 kilowatts or 2 megawatts. The power numbers aren't very big despite these fairly large sizes of the chimney height and the collector diameter. This already tells us that the efficiency of these chimneys can't be very high. There was a pilot project in the early 80s in Spain in Manzanares. There they built a chimney that was 195 meters high with a collector of 240 meters diameter. This corresponds to 46,000 square meters area. The output peak was 50 kilowatts. So if we calculate the efficiency, 50 kilowatts divided by 46,000 square meters, we end up at an efficiency of 0.1%. This is a magnitude below other solar power plants and therefore the advantage of chimneys needs to be found elsewhere. It may be that chimneys are interesting for some applications because of their low price and their simple technology. After two years of successful operation this chimney was dismantled again and the project ended. A decidedly low-tech approach to using solar thermal energy are solar water heaters. The principle is very simple. 
one pumps water through a box that is outfitted with a black absorber plate and some insulation and a transparent cover and the water as it circulates gets heated. The efficiency can be pretty high of these designs, but the heat is low grade. One couldn't make electricity with this type of heat. So the water typically gets heated to 60 or 80 centigrades. But this is perfect for residential applications to supplement the electric or gas powered water heater. It is also great for swimming pools. In fact, this is one of the solar technologies that are widely used in the United States. An interesting bit of history, 80% of all new houses built in Miami in the 30s had a solar water heater. By 1950 all these were gone because fossil fuel was so cheap. A counterexample is Israel, where currently 85% of all households use thermal systems. That corresponds to a 3% savings of the national energy use. Here you see a picture of the uh, typical Israeli system. Here are the panels and this here is a, a reservoir. Here you see the uh, power flow in a residential solar heater in the UK. This is January through December. And this here is the power that goes into the water heater. You see here there is a residential solar thermal panel on the roof of this house. And this water heater has an electrical immersion heater and then we have the solar powered water heater. And so we see that during the uh, summer months there is very little electricity needed to provide hot water water for this house and in winter when there is less sun and colder temperatures then the immersion heater kicks in. This table shows a few specs of solar thermal water heaters that are commercially available. The most interesting number is definitely the maximum efficiency that can be achieved by these water heaters. The efficiencies are in the 60 to 70 percent range which is much higher than what is achieved by plants that try to make electricity from solar energy. This means that with a two square meter system one can produce three kilowatt hours per day in a moderate climate and seven kilowatt hours per day in a tropical climate. So this is probably what would be applicable for Florida almost. This is the equivalent of heating 200 liters of water by 25 centigrades in the uh, tropical environment. That is almost sufficient to heat water to a temperature that is good for taking a shower. This concludes part two of the solar energy segment. Thanks for watching.